auteur means author. And the French developed this theory that the director is the author of the movie and should be totally in control of the movie and all that kind of stuff. And I'm considered an auteur director, but I've never signed my movies, a, uh, a movie by Lloyd Kaufman. I've never, I, it's always a trauma team production directed by Lloyd Kaufman. Whereas you see almost every movie now that the, the, the director signs it, the movie by Michael Bay. You know, I mean, these two hundred million dollar movies—they're they're not personal statements, they're, but they, they, they do it, and they, they believe me. Those guys compromise lots. They have to. But what your favorite? But, but What's that? But the, you live your life according to one philosophy, which is to thine own self. I live my life with one philosophy? According to one uh, philosophy. Obey my wife, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's always said, makes me say that, I don't know why. What advice would I give to somebody with no experience who wants to get out there and uh, just uh, get some on, uh, hands on experience? I think you, you go, get, uh, go online, see what movies are being made. Um, if there's a particular director, what I did was I attached, I, I identified uh, a couple of talented directors and then I did their laundry or ran errands for them. And when they got a gig, uh, they gave me a job. And th in fact, I actually got paying jobs. Not much, but I got paying jobs. And because I had worked for free, I, I moved up to Food Chain a lot faster. I think the key is that one way or another, get on a set and, with a good director. Get on the set with somebody you admire and and um, do it, don't think about money. Don't think you're being used. If anything, you're using them. You're going to learn uh, what the film school might teach you for $50,000 a year. Uh, and I'm not saying don't go to film school, because film school, I'm not agnostic about that. But it does seem rather expensive to go to NYU or USC. Uh, so my advice would be, uh, especially if you have no, uh, not sure, Get on a set, whatever you do, go to, look at the, the trade magazines, uh, they're online, the Variety and Hollywood Reporter, they list what movies are being made. Uh, you have a film commissioner here in Florida, there's a film office, they'll tell you what's going on, and, and go, go there, go, go to wherever it is and talk to, tell, talk to the, the, anyone you can speak to, and tell them you'll get up at 5 in the morning and go to, stay up there 24-7 and do whatever it takes. Uh, assuming it's not something uh, morally incorrect, <laughs> which unfortunately is too much of the rule that is used in the mainstream. The question of uh, practical effects versus CGI. I, as I mentioned, I don't play video games, and even on the $200 million movies, I don't get the CGI. It looks fake. The explosions and, you know, if, you, if, if I'm doing a car stunt, and I've done a few of them, I do it for real. Uh, but I get, there I don't save money, I get professionals and safety is the most important rule in trauma, trauma bill, safety of humans is by far the most important rule. Uh, we have never had a serious injury um, and um, in 40 years of making a maybe 100 movies we've never had a serious injury and the mainstream has, Big Morrow uh, had his head, had two children had their heads chopped off in uh, the Twilight Zone and, and horrible things done with with big 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 budget movies. So so uh, I would do the car stunts for real. It looks always looks better, and you can and you can and you can do it safely. Um, the CGI that we could afford, does, I don't think would look very good. So that's another reason I don't do it. And our fans tend to. I find uh, if you go to my Twitter at Lloyd Kaufman, you'll see the fans are always bad. At least our fans. They're not, they don't like CGI, uh, they really don't. I used a little of it in return to Nukem High because we had a couple of talented young people who uh, improved what we shot practically with CGI. Um, and in, uh, in Poultry Guys, Night of the Chicken Dead, we used CGI to erase uh, filament and to make some smoke, but that's about it. I just don't think it works on our level. And I'm not so sure, aesthetically for me, uh, CGI works on, uh, on the big time. What would happen if I was given a $200 million budget? Yeah. Uh, I would give, if I were given that kind of money, I would give, I don't even know how to do the arithmetic, I would probably give four, uh, 398 people 500,000 each, and then I would use the rest of the money to make a movie. But I'd give each of them money to make a movie, and I guarantee you we would get some 
classic masterpieces that way. Right? We have four of them. I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. That last guy did. I think it's obscene, really, to spend. We, we, look at the world we live in. I mean, look at the devastation of starving people and children. And, I mean, it's horrible. I mean, it's really horrible and very upsetting. Uh, you know, everybody got drunk on St. Patrick's Day. There were one million Irish, one million Irish, a little island with hardly anyone living here. One million people died in the potato famine. And, and everyone's on the TV, it's all about, oh, you know, grow Poda and the Cathy Lee, right? Let's drink some green wine, no more. They, they should be talking about that. Like one million Irish died of uh, the potato famine. 200,000 Syrians are dead. Uh, there's going to be a wheat famine in Northern Africa. There already is. Not enough wheat. It's doubled, it's doubled and tripled in price. Uh, we, we shouldn't spend that kind of $200 million on a movie. That's, that's horrible. Why should a, a human being get $30 million for one piece of celluloid? That's an obscenity. Come to revolution. You know, there's going to be, there's going to be help. By the way, this is not Roy, this is not Roy Kaufman talking. This is, this is the bath salts.
And um, I think, that, again, these are decisions that you have to make, the business decisions that you've got to make. Um, if you in your heart believe that this project is going to make money, then say it. But I cannot, I cannot tell anyone who I'm speaking to about the movie by Lloyd Kaufman that it's going to make money. I can't say that. In fact, if I, I have to say the opposite. I have to say, if you give us money, be prepared to lose most of it. In fact, uh, the, my wife uh, invested most of the money for Poultry Guys, Night of the Chicken Dead, which is a great movie. In a fair world, it would be a huge hit. But when you're an independent studio, it was very hard to penetrate the hymen of the mainstream. And we are really blacklisted. And Poultry Guys, you check it out. It's a great movie if you haven't seen it. 95% uh, of the budget that went down the drain. Half a million bucks. So, and I, so there's no way I can tell someone, invest in uh, Return to Newcomb High Volume 1, you're going to make a lot of money. I have to say the opposite. Invest, invest in Return to Newcomb High and be a patron of the arts. But, you know, there are plenty of people in the movie industry who, you know, think they have the winning formula, and uh, maybe they do, but I can't say that. I think it's a business decision, but it's a very good question. How do you go from making uh, YouTube videos to uh, being a full-length movie? Yeah. Well, uh, How do I, like, form a series? I don't think there are any rules. You mean a, a serious plot? Yeah. You mean a, a kind of a, a, a character study or something? Uh, you write the script and you make it. And my wife says you write the script and you make it. Uh, yeah, but it's, um, I don't think there are any rules, really. I have written six books about making movies, so you, should, you know, they're pretty much uh, available everywhere, or online. I'm sure you can find them for free. We do happen to have them at booth number 727, <laughs> safely and securely here at the Megacon. I, you know, I don't think there are any rules for that. That's what my wife says. Do it. You know, do it. Don't. You know, I worked on Rocky. Sylvester Stallone was unknown. He was obsessed with this project. He wanted to star in it. He spent time. He, he, he made it happen. He willed it to happen. He, he made it happen. I think that's the way you got to go, unless you got a rich uncle who's, you know, in other words, I think you just have to be driven. Uh, the gentleman in the back with the panther. Do you find with the increased content going digital that the medium on traditional discs is not as cost-effective as putting a pay-per-view or digital content only format out? Or which one, which one is more cost-effective? Well, I mean, shooting on Distribution, I think you go on everything, everything. Uh, making DVDs does cost money. Yeah, you can't do one. I don't. It's very hard to do one at a time. It's rather labor intensive. Uh, so it gets expensive. But you know, what am online? I don't see anybody making money except for uh, maybe maybe uh, Avatar. You know, I don't. I, we haven't made any money. I'll tell you that. In fact, we are grateful to our fans. Uh, we're giving away 250 free trauma movies. We put a new one up every week to commemorate uh, our 40 years of uh, movie making, and we're giving them away. Uh, we think that might be more, that might be a better investment than having uh, Netflix show them and pay us 10 cents. We'd rather just give them away. And, and so far, our company has made very little from anything other than uh, the tradition, you know, maybe DVD, I guess DVD is probably our, still our biggest uh, incentive, but uh, the PVP is going way down because people are watching online. Or how did the cartoon of uh, Toxic Avenger come, come around? Uh, the the Trump is rather historic. I've told you all these famous people that have come out of it, but the Toxic Avenger in the history of, of, of cinema is the only uh, movie in which a young boy's head gets squashed by the wheel of an automobile that was made into a delightful children's environmentally correct uh, cartoon show, <laughs> which was shown on Fox. And, I, and later a Broadway musical. And in fact, uh, later a Broadway musical. Yes, the Toxic Adventure musical was made. Uh, and a Bon Jovi guy, one of his, one of Bon Jovi, uh, one of the original Bon Jovi, uh, the keyboard guy, David Bryan, wrote the music. It's very good. Uh, I honestly, I don't, I. The only thing I can surmise is that uh, the toy company, uh, Playmates, they wanted an environmental toy. And they wanted to make the environmental action figures, and they didn't see the movie. <laughs> and I, 
I honestly I don't know how it happened, but the cartoons are great. They're really good. We did have uh, control over them. We signed. We had the power to to uh, sign off on all the scripts. In fact, we wrote uh, three or four of the scripts. So we were able to be uncompromising with the cartoons, and they're quite good. Uh, they're free on uh, our Troma YouTube channel. I, I don't know how many, but there are at least uh, 12 or 13 of them uh, totally free on, uh, and, on uh, the YouTube, Troma YouTube channel. And they're mention, very funny. And mention who produced them with you, Chuck Lorre. Yeah, and in fact, uh, the guy who wrote the pilot and who also wrote the amazing Toxic Crusaders theme song is Chuck Lorre, who went on to do uh, Big Bang and, uh, and, uh, and modern uh, Roseanne. Band. And, uh, I think Modern Family. No, no, Two modern and a family. Half Men. Two and a Half Men, that's right. He and Charlie Sheen had the famous uh, contretemps. So uh, another famous person coming from the loins of the troll. Uh, read, if you read the reviews of Return to Newcom High, starting from New York Times down, the ones who know movies, they see Laurel and Hardy, they see Chaplin, they see John Ford, they see uh, the, the classics really of what has informed our movies. Um, uh, is that your question, pretty much? Or? It's more directors, the work of individual directors. Everything by Chaplin, everything by John Ford, everything by Keith, by Keith. not that I've seen everything. Everything by Laurel and Hardy, everything by the Three Stooges. I like Tom and Jerry cartoons. And, um, you know, today I'm, today I'm, I think I'm inspired by uh, younger directors like Miss Gucci, the Japanese dude who did Happiness of the Katakuri, Kitakari, whatever they are. He actually had, he does, uh, if you know Mika, he does uh, horror and gore and mixes the genres. And he was a big drama fan uh, when he was young. But I've been looking at his stuff, and with Poultry Guys Night of the Chicken Dead, he gave me the courage to do the, make it into a musical, because he had, had some singing and dancing in his movies. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's some younger ones I'm influenced by, but again, I'm from the 60s, so I was influenced more by the directors who were uh, classic. Time I was coming along. I don't think there are any models or formulas. I think uh, you know. Uh, I, I just I don't think there is any formula that over time will work. I think it's as simple as that. You know, maybe it works for one or two movies, and then they go away. I mean, I'm 68 years old. I'm I'm still making movies, and plenty of these people with formulas and uh, have. Huge hits, huge hits, and they're not here now. And probably not because they're making bad movies, it's probably because somebody in a suit has changed his or her, or its mind, or who knows. But I don't think there are any formulas. And I think that's a big mistake to, uh, to try to do something with a business model. Uh, the, the, the studios have a cartel. They have a monop almost a monopoly. It's a club, it's a giant devil-worshipping club of <laughs> international media conglomerates, and they control the market. And boy, Paranormal got lucky. You know, he and uh, Pelly and Bloom, and they were, I think Spielberg had a, uh, in fact, I interviewed Robert Pelly, he's in my book, he's in my book, either, I can't remember which one, but he tells the whole story about uh, paranormal activity. And apparently Spielberg is involved in, in making the decision, and, and in fact, in changing the movie. Uh, and Pelly agrees with the change. Uh, read my book, or it, it's, uh, I think we just put Oren Pelly's interview online. We've got a Make Your Own Damn Movie channel. It's also totally free. Every week we put up a new uh, lesson, a new chapter, a new interview. Uh, check out Oren Pelly. Check out what he says, and I think you'll get more enlightenment about that particular business model. But there are thousands of movies made now for fifteen thousand uh, dollars. They don't all gross two hundred million. Uh, where do where do where do I start with a script? I can only tell you what I do, which is I get interested in a theme or a subject, uh, usually something in society. Uh, Troma had a building, uh, the Troma Building on Ninth Avenue in New York, and McDonald's moved in next door, and they were nasty neighbors. And we soon had rats the size of raccoons in our basement. They were weekending in our basement. 
And um, I read, as a result, uh, Gabe Friedman, who was uh, our editor, uh, he gave me uh, Fast Food Nation to read. And then I realized, oh my God, this is fast food thing, this is terrible. Uh, so I got obsessed with that. And that's kind of out of that grew uh, poultry guys. Pat, uh, my wife, that's my wife, she has a man's name, of course. Uh, uh, we uh, used to go camping, and uh, there was McDonald's. This was before uh, biodegradable McDonald's crap, and uh, before Al Gore got involved and took out a Nobel Peace Prize that two other scientists didn't get uh, through, uh, before we invented the internet, a uh, long time ago. And I was getting newsletters about the environment, about toxic waste dumps ticking away like time bombs, and children in Rio playing with pixie dust in the dumps, and which pixie dust was radium from uh, uh, x-ray machines that were tossed out by hospitals, you know, that kind of stuff. And that led to the toxic event. So, so I get interested in, a, uh, in a, some kind of issue that's in the, uh, in the ether or in the uh, newspapers. And then I go from there, you know, maybe a little story. Or, but the, 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 again, there's no rules to it. Uh, I think the hardest thing is just you gotta keep going. Keep, keep moving, keep, get, keep moving forward, get it done. Get it done, don't rush it, but do it. Do it. And, and uh, some people, literally, John Hershey, who was a great Nobel Prize winning author, uh, I had lunch with him once and I said, yeah, we just have to sit down at the table. He wrote a bell for a demo in Hiroshima. And, and I asked him, you know, how do you, how do you write a book? <laughs> how do you do it? And he says, I force myself to sit down every day and I write a certain number of pages and I just grind it out. I, I can't do that, of course. And in fact, I work with other people. Uh, poultry guys, there's four or five writers. Uh, there are three of us who mainly wrote it, but there's a couple of other people who certainly contributed to it and who have credit. So, and, and I, again, I don't think, but that's, for me, that's the hardest part, getting a script that doesn't suck. It's really hard. Do we prefer making the props or buying them? I, I, a lot of what we do has to be custom made. You know, we, they've got to be original. We can't, we, we have a monster in a movie, we can't, you know, use a Godzilla monster because it would be some mean lawyers would come back. <laughs> Dirty chew lawyers would be nice. <laughs> So we've got to make them ourselves, pretty much. Um, sometimes you can take ready-made props and, you know, rubber knives and, you know, fool around with them and alter them and customize them or whatever. But for the most part, we, and, and the, the ones you buy are often very expensive. So we, 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 I think we pretty much make everything. And a lot of it, and again, I talk about this in my books, all my books about the making and directing movies, I talk about the props and how most of the problems can be solved just by common sense. How much research is done for background? That's a great question, and I think it's very important. Trauma movies are very crazy, and uh, it's great to have one foot uh, in uh, reality. And when, um, when we were, uh, for example, doing the Toxic Avenger volume, uh, part one, the first Toxic Avenger, we went to the lighthouse for the blind and we talked to them and we talked to people. And then when we cast uh, Andre Miranda as Sarah, uh, we had her go over there and take lessons on uh, how to uh, be blind, you know, how to act like a blind person. You know? and I think it's very important. And the more, the more reality you can give to uh, a crazy movie, to any movie, uh, I think the better. Uh, with um, locations, look at Rocky. Imagine if you didn't have those locations. Uh, imagine if it really, if you tried to fake Philadelphia and do it on Long Island. Uh, I don't think it would work. Uh, and the producers wanted to, they wanted to, they didn't want to shoot in Philadelphia. They wanted to shoot in uh, LA and fake it. And Stallone and John Allison, the directors, uh, convinced them to shoot in Philadelphia and do it in, for real, do it with the, the script is all about Philadelphia. And uh, that's why Troma got involved, because we, our non-union crew that had just done Cry Uncle, which John Allison directed, shot all the Philadelphia stuff. It was all done non-union. And, uh, and then uh, uh, we got caught, the Teamsters, I think, caught us on the eighth day, and that stopped, and they all went back to LA to, to do it the union way. Uh, do we get money from overseas? Uh, an excellent question. Um, sometimes, yes, yes. Um, that's why it's not a bad idea to uh, own your movies. 
rather than give away all the distribution rights, own them. Because uh, a movie you made uh, 20 years ago uh, might be worth something when the wall comes down, uh, when Mr. Gorbachev tears down that wall. Uh, suddenly, Russia wants, uh, you know, they've got capitalist society, they want movies. We had 50 or 60 movies that we sold to them. Not for very much, but, you know, for us, a little company was very significant. Uh, the international community is uh, a good place to get money for your movies, but you have to remember that the uh, the taste of the inter of other countries is very different and difficult. Uh, action is universal, but the comedy, which is what Troma does, we do satire. We mix gore and, and violence and satire and slapstick and romance, and we we Cuisinart, the, we're like a Cuisinart of genres, and basically our movies are comedies. And what's funny in Florida may not be funny in Ohio, and might not be funny in Italy or Russia or Ukraine. So comedy is pretty dangerous from the international group. And, and we go up and down. Sometimes Troma's like uh, a fad in some of the uh, European and Asian countries, and other times uh, they, we're out of favor. So it's, uh, but it's certainly important, without a doubt. And we go to the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, there's a big uh, market there where we, uh, uh, present our movies, the new movies there, and see if there are distributors. Uh, distributors come there to, to buy the rights to movies. Uh, we do that kind of stuff. Good question. And again, from a business point of view, I don't do any of this, but from a smart business point of view, it's a very good idea to, to think about how is this movie going to work in the international uh, markets. And certainly with the big budget movies, you've got suits uh, spending hours and hours debating that. And, and taking things out of the scripts and putting them in, and uh, you know, that's why there's a dog in every cartoon. Except for Toxic Crusaders, he had a pet, but it was a little piece of oil spill. Who else, who else didn't get to ask a question? Yes, sir. Who will win in the fight, Toxic or Batman? Who what? Who will win in the fight, Toxic or Batman? Who will win in the fight, Toxic or Batman? You have to ask that question. <laughs> Don't you know? But again, you know, it's interesting. Our fans, uh, we're very interactive with our fans. And uh, I had a, 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 I think it was my second book, I was on a book tour. And every store that people would raise their who would, who would win if Toxy and Kabuki Man, Sergeant Kabuki Man and NYPD had a fight? Who would win? And at first I said, that's a stupid question. And that was a stupid question. <laughs> But, uh, uh, I'm joking. Uh, but then I, people kept asking, uh, fans, devoted fans kept asking, who would win Toxie and Sergeant Kabuki and NYPD in a fight? So I figured, okay, we better, we better use that. So if the Citizen Toxie, uh, they do have a fight, except that Sergeant Kabuki and NYPD is a good guy, and Toxie's a good guy, so they can't fight. So that led us to the alternate universe where we had evil Kabuki man fighting good Toxie. But uh, our fans, it was just that question over and over and over again that said to me, well, our fans want to see that, so I'm going to make it happen. So, but I can't answer the other Batman one. I don't know. I know that the Toxic Avenger movies probably sell more tickets, but other than that, I don't know. <laughs> Batman, does anybody know who's that guy? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Which is the best Batman and Robin? By the way, the guy who directed uh, Batman and Robin, uh, yeah, I think he wrote and directed it. He's the Oscar-winning producer who is uh, leading the charge on the remake, the big budget remake of the Toxic Avenger. That's the one where you see Robin's nipples. That's why he selected that name. Who else has an answer for Guy in the back. In the back, yes, sir. Uh, the gentleman has asked uh, about, uh, well, first of all, the two-hour movie. I don't think two hours is a good length of a movie. Uh, uh, to me, the, the best length is about 85 minutes. I think that makes the most sense. But, uh, and you, you notice so many of these movies today are very, very long. And I don't, sometimes it works, but other times it's just a big ego trip, I think. Um, uh, we, again, we, I shoot a lot of film. When I was using 35 millimeter, uh, that was the one luxury. I used a lot of film, three cameras and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and now with digital, you can 
shoot forever, except that then you have to download everything and, uh, and block it or whatever, and it's very, very difficult. I, again, it's a personal opinion. You know, we, we, we prepare a lot, but we also do a lot of improvising on the set. So we're constantly changing and trying, and so we do shoot a lot. I don't, I, honestly, I don't even know what our ratio is, but it's big. It's, it's very big. We shoot a lot of film or digital. digital. Uh, I'll be looking forward to receiving a big check from the remake. Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if they make, you know, if they make it, uh, it would be wonderful. It would enable us to make more, uh, more taxi and more car movies. You said it. Um, and by the way, Oscar-winning producer who produced and wrote uh, *A Beautiful Mind* is the main guy, and Matt Van Rum. Sorry about that. Uh, They've got Stephen Pink, uh, who wrote the script and is supposed to direct. He's very good. He did Hot Tub Time Machine, uh, High Fidelity, Grossy Point Blank. He's a great director, and he loves trauma, and he's good. You don't go to movie jail for making a good uh, sequel or a good uh, remake, right? You, you can make it. It is possible to make a good remake. And some of the greatest movies of all time have been remakes and sequels. So. You know, I, whether or not they pull it off, I don't know, but they seem very confident, and I'm not heavily involved with it, so uh, I don't know. But it is a Broadway show that's touring around, and they did that, so who knows? Toxie's got a life of his own. Toxie. I could have a, an appointment with the uh, business end of a shotgun, and Toxie would go on. That's for sure. One more question. Who has that? Behind the back. This lady. What do I love about making films? I think the entire creative process and working with other people, being a team and, and uh, having it, it's, it, it's extremely stressful, but it's also an awful lot of fun. It's horribly stressful on the set, but yet it's also fun to have a group together that they're creating something, some illusion. And uh, you know, I, I think that that's really the, the whole thing. It's a great, uh, a great uh, amusement to make art. You know, it's art. And you like having your platform to to, to express your. Yes, and my wife says I have a huge ego, and uh, <laughs> I have certain things Not. I want to say, certain, <laughs> certain statements. I know what you're getting at. I know what you're getting at. You're correct. No, but you. Uh, one more question. We had somebody had a question. Who, who didn't have the question? Is that you? You didn't have a question, right? Oh, you didn't get to answer it. Yeah. Answer the question. Uh oh, you better stand up and yell because I can't hear you. With characters like Toxic and Toxic and Carson Wentz, are you sure you'll see a new character to create a new character inserting the tone? Or is it the tone? For those of you who cannot hear, a uh, gentleman in the back said that Lloyd Kaufman is his favorite movie director. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, are we creating new characters? I think there'll be some new ones in uh, in the uh, Toxy Five, the Toxic Twins, and um, perhaps yeah, yeah. Uh, what? Yes, they're, um, they're working on Clappy Clydesdale, the dancing horse. Uh, <laughs> they call it Bud for short. At any rate, on that, on that very happy note, uh, thank you so much for being <laughs> <laughs>